Hey guys, Andrew Doby here and welcome to Just a Chat With. In our previous episode, we spoke to Rob Mayhew, a stand-up comic, TikTok star and head of influence at Fleischmann UK. Fleischmann Hillard UK even. With 20 years worth of agency experience under his belt, Rob uses his unique viewpoint and comedic timing to create viral videos about agency life um, that we completely love in our agency and have resonated right across the industry. We had a brilliant time. Go and watch that if you haven't already. Quick announcement. If you're listening right now on Spotify, um, you might notice we're also doing a video on here. So hi, um, which is also pretty cool. We also do that on YouTube. So if you didn't know that, you can also watch us on YouTube. Um, on Spotify, though, we're also doing a little poll because we're trying to make the podcast even better. So if you're on Spotify, just swipe up from the bottom. Um, we'd love to have your um, feedback on the show and let us know where and how we can improve. If this is your first time listening, we've had loads of amazing people on the show. So if you haven't checked out already, we've had people like design legend Michael Wolf. We've had Chris Doe from the future. We've had Debbie Millman. We've had... Who else we had? We've had Noah Cloquet from Pixar and loads, loads more. So go check them out. In today's episode, though, I sit down with James Cross, who is the creative director at BBC Creative, which is the BBC's in-house creative studio. Um, it was launched back in 2016. James joined shortly after in 2017, and they have been producing some of the best creative work in the creative industry. Um, he's worked at agency side at Likes of McCann, and he talked to, to us today a lot about his journey through the creative industries, how he got started. We talked about what his role looks like as a creative director and how they're producing some of the best work we see in today's world. So I hope you enjoy it and look forward to seeing you next time. James, thanks so much for being here. How are you? No I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good, good. today. We had, a, we had a few technical difficulties getting us both on here, but we're, just, we've, we've managed. Just a few, yeah, last. we had the, the thrills of uh, public sector IT, but um, we're here now. <laughs> here we are. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I see, I see you're working from home today. Is, mm -hmm. Are you still, BBC, still in a sort of hybrid, remote kind yeah, of work? Yeah, or? like, um, I think that people are pushing for a bit more, but uh, we're currently operating on a Tuesday, Thursday in the office model. I think there's a there's more of a movement now for people to go back and be sat together and in, in real life, which, you know, actually makes it uh, from initially being a lot of us were in a situation where we were like, this is great working from home. We don't, we don't need an office to now the, the culture is certainly, I think people want to be, be together and be a bit more human again. For sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think everyone's obviously exploring that and figuring it out. And I think mm. creative teams, especially, there's something that you can miss with the kind of creative collaboration. Do you, do you think that's something that you're? I mean, obviously, you'll have some influence there in terms of yeah. leading a team. Um, is, is it something that now you think you'll try and get them together more? Um, do you think that will be a permanent thing, or do you think you'll just come together for moments of collaboration and then let people move apart for? Uh, um, I, it's kind of. Funny. I think. I think creatively i think we kind of it's great to be together but i've always been of the belief that it's also good to get away and you know be in my own space as well so it's kind of what whatever people need i think certainly the younger members of the creative department these days they don't have i think what i enjoy is someone very senior coming up and just talking at the water cooler or or whatever go for mm. a sandwich with someone is it's kind of where you learn loads of stuff and you get new ideas um, when you're sat and all you've got in front of you is is your laptop. Then you know it tends not to be the, the most inspiring of environments. Yeah. So I, I suppose beyond the work, then are you you know are you sort of um, are you using any other techniques to get teams together or you know because I, I suppose you're right that that those younger people that are just coming into the workplace mm. they miss all the things you hear around you happening in a busy studio don't you and you miss that yeah, kind of exactly. learning you used to soak mm. in by osmosis yeah exactly um we are i mean other than doing sort of days and plenty you know we do way more socials uh, than we used to do um it seems now because there's a there's a real desire for them other than the the days in the office uh we're not doing masses more um we've got a busy creative we're actually moving to um broadcasting house in uh, near Oxford Circus, uh, which is really exciting as well. So that's also given us a bit of impetus to sort of get back in and, and, and get together. 
Oh, great, yeah. great. So, um, obviously, you know, you, you, um, you're creative director for BBC's um, creative team. Um, mm-hmm. For a lot of people that are listening and, you know, they'll be aware, everyone's aware of the BBC. But how does that team sit in, in the BBC and what is the kind of roles and responsibility that team has? Well, we're, uh, so BBC Creative is responsible for all uh, advertising and marketing output of the, the BBC. So we're, we're promoting all the shows. Um, we started off where we were competing with some retained agencies. Um, mm-hmm. And pretty much within a year of being established in uh, 2016, we've kind of seen all those agencies off and proven that we could, we could do it ourselves. Um, and that's sort of testament to the work. Uh, Justin Barami, the director and you know, the guy who set this up, um, yeah. his ambition because we hired, you know, people from the agency world who, so we could really compete with the Karma Ramas and um, uh, Y&R as it was. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we've been going for uh, six years now, of which uh, Tim, my partner, and I have been there five and a half. Uh, we yeah. set up Manchester. But so, yeah, our remit is to promote everything that's going on at the BBC um how we sit we kind of we are sat within the office so it's weird having your clients in the same office but amazing at the same time um Mm -hmm. but we try to stay try not to go native and i think there is a there's a real importance to that that we don't just become another bbc department we're kind of you know (laughs) Uh, rubbing against the grain somewhat and trying to provoke and do new things and Mm. we very much it's very much our remit that we're looking after you know the the survival and the future of the bbc because it's the media landscape is it's rapidly changing all the time um the license fee is a super hot topic um so it's up to us to to bring people to the bbc and and show that sort of tremendous value that that it offers yeah so do, do, so do you feel like there's a different kind of culture in the, the team that you guys work in um compared to the wider bbc for example i was in i remember being in ibm i don't know six or seven years ago and they had a kind yeah. of in-house agency and almost like the suits weren't allowed to go anywhere near the creative agency and it was like this glass i remember walking into <laughs> london there was like a glass wall and you could kind of look at the cool agency people <laughs> yeah and yeah. then you went upstairs and there was all the kind of suits and kind of technicians etc I'm, I'm just interested is has it developed into kind of like a micro culture for me the bbc has always felt kind of like it has a good culture um, and yeah. i'm just wondering if there's a differentiation between both parts yeah, I'd say so. It definitely, there's, to me, there's BBC people and there's BBC creative people. And I think mm-hmm. we're quite proud to sit in the corner of our office, even in, in uh, Salford or in London, uh, mm-hmm. away from everyone else. But we are we are kind of mixed. There's no, there's no glass walls or anything. Everyone's wandering <laughs> around. And for me, the marketing team from Sport or, or CBeebies can wander down the stairs and come and hang out um and it's good it's a good way uh to get to good work is to just be friendly and have great relationships is i think one thing the whole in-house structures taught me is that the the best work you do is often when you have the the best relationships with people and that's not that's not a corporate line it's kind of it's yeah it's a, a genuine delight of of what we're doing i mean it, that's not to say you don't come up against people that are difficult and, you know, but if the relationship is not as good, then we don't, the work tends not to be as good. It's, it's, it's funny how it works. The collaboration is, is so beneficial. I know it's amazing also at channel four and uh, sky sky creative is, is becoming a force now as well. It's, um, it's a model that really works in, in the broader broadcast industry for, for sure. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, you've certainly proven that, that, you know, you can create great work. I think I'm, I'm constantly astounded by how many awards and how many fantastic pieces of work <laughs> keep coming out of that studio. And it's oh, just, it's, it's, it's amazing. So you must be, you must be super proud. Um, I mean, in terms of the kind of size and scale of that team, is it, I, I think I read somewhere maybe 150 people or is that about yeah. right? Yeah, it's, so we split across two sites. So there's uh, up to 30 of us in Salford, where I'm, I'm based primarily, mm-hmm. primarily um, and sort of 120 to 150 in, in London. The BBC is, um, I mean, we're set up where 
one third of our workforce has to be freelance. So it's kind of a, a real churn of new faces all the time. But the mm. core 66% permanent people tend to be around for a long time and, you know, very happy there. But like I say, most of us are, are from traditional commercial ad agencies. Um, mm. So we've kind of brought that culture into the BBC, which does make us a slightly different breed. Um mm-hmm. But it, it, yeah, it's, it works, and you've got to you've got to adapt to to how the sort of the public sector ness of the BBC and everyone else how they operate. And yeah, so far so good. They they back us, they believe in us, they let us experiment and take risks. Um, and I suppose that comes with not being a commercial entity in that in that yeah. respect. Um, but you know the the proofs in the pudding that you know, like you say, we've we can do stuff and that would be very hard to do in my, I used to be at my can. It would have been hard to do yeah. to take these sort of risks, I suppose, from a production point of view um, there, because the also the, in those risks, the production companies themselves are prepared to take a bit of a punt as well. And they're going to try something. Uh, favors are way easier to come by because we've got, um, we can give people so much exposure, so the production companies so much exposure for their work. Um, yeah. So it's quite a sort of creative utopia. It obviously has its problems, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's been yeah. On the whole, it's yeah. I cannot I can't complain about a thing. Really can't. Yeah, no, great. And and in terms of your role, you're a creative director. That obviously mm-hmm. means something slightly different in every agency in-house team depending on size and scale would you mind talking us through a little bit about the kind of roles responsibilities you have and what a general day looks like for someone who doesn't have any idea what a creative director does (laughs) well (laughs) uh, it's every so you know every day is different it's kind of i suppose in the main um you're kind i'm i'm dealing with marketing teams often um during the day but also just being that sort of the like the orchestra conductor somewhat um Mm -hmm. it starts with sort of our planning team and our planning teams are bouncing stuff off us we're not we we will have a little bit of influence over the planning and we'll be inputting into that but then we're seeing the brief the work through to the brief and is the brief good briefing the teams helping the teams develop their ideas um I think very important that we're not putting our ideas onto our teams, which I think you can sometimes mm-hmm. get with uh, certainly creative directors I've worked for in the past. That, sure. um, but yeah, we kind of encourage and and let people do brilliant stuff. And then it's I suppose for Tim and I, it's our job for then to make that viable. Um, mm-hmm. And Tim's so, your creative partner for anyone listening, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Tim, so yeah, Tim. Yeah. Tim's kind of the the quiet one. He, like if we're the pet shop boys, um, Neil <laughs> Tennant. He's back on the keyboard. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we, we're making that work as, as amazing as it can be using our mm-hmm. contacts and our relationships with, I don't know, Nexus Studios or Blinkink or whoever it is to say, we've got something really cool. Are you interested in this? We haven't got as much money as it probably takes to make. Would you be interested? And, you know, sometimes they say yes. And, mm-hmm. yeah, we make, make something great. And then taking it through, making sure – that single idea spreads through everything because these days um, probably more than ever, it's important not just to preach to the choir. We've got to get off the BBC channels and get Mm. noticed everywhere else. Um, uh, So yeah, that's, that's our job sort of that we're kind of with through with, Mm -hmm. with the process from the start to the very end, right. To signing, you know, every single iteration of that idea off. Um, Yeah. And, and how many control. how many teams will you generally have working underneath you then? Uh, so create so traditional creative teams, art director, copywriters. Um, mm-hmm. I think we've got um, maybe six or seven uh, freelancers mm-hmm. that can go up to maybe ten, eleven. Um, mm-hmm. And then within that, we also have another type of creative at, at the BBC. We call uh, a promo director, um, mm-hmm. which is essentially, I suppose, kind of creative editing. So it's those smaller jobs where the creators are purely cutting clips. So they might get an episode of EastEnders. Okay, we need a 20-second teaser for that. And they are writing, editing, producing, doing everything they need to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a a real mixed bag. And that's 
something we we've never encountered before the BBC, but the the world of clip based trails has been a, a, a real learning curve too. Yeah. yeah absolutely. No, absolutely. Um and you know, I, I suppose um you know, thinking back to your childhood, I'm guessing you've always been creative, right? Because I, I see the guitars behind you. We spoke about them previously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, you've had a raft of creative jobs. Would you mind talking us through kind of what the early years of your life looked like? And if were, were you always heading towards a creative job or and were you encouraged to do so? Or how, how did that sort of pan out for you? Uh, I don't think I was ever necessarily, well, maybe without realising, I think I've always liked writing and um i've like always liked art i've always been into music um mm -hmm. without really realizing it my we i had a weird ambition to i wanted to be a fighter pilot at one point and then i wanted to work on wall street because i thought oh yeah money and a ferrari and an amazing you track. must be loving maverick then at the moment i take it yeah yeah that's great <laughs> um and then kind of a week i got older got a bit more cynical and it was all about music so it was I was at such a perfect age when sort of Britpop started and it was like a mm -hmm. real influence of um, getting into music. Wanted to went and brought a guitar straight away. A bit of a cliche. Mm -hmm. How old do you know, James, just for everyone? Just so I'm everyone 40, understands. 41 years old. <laughs> 41. Uh, so, We're exactly yeah, so, the same age. We're the same age. Oh, okay, right. So, yeah, so <laughs> just that perfect age when that all started. And then, um, yeah, I think what I always want to do is go into the music industry. Mm -hmm. um, and as I studied that and I got a job at Pop Tones Records, which is uh, was Alan McGee's label after uh, Creation Records, um, sure. which was a kind of, I don't think this is libelous to say, but like a cocaine clouded nightmare. Uh, <laughs> it was just awful. Uh, and I was there and that's all I wanted to do is be in the music industry. And I realized working in the music industry, not being a musician, was essentially lots of admin and spreadsheets and shifting CDs. And it was, I realized pretty quickly I, I hated it. So they let me write press releases, um, of which I'd done a bit of freelance journalism. Um, mm -hmm. And then that was it. From there, I became a copywriter, a, a computer brochure uh, business, and then mm -hmm. blacked a job at BMB uh, with. Um, a slightly drunk creative director and we spoke about led zeppelin for an hour um and my knowledge of led zeppelin is what got me into the industry it was like can you start one day it's okay um so complete fluke um but my, i mean my whole family is pretty creative in kind of non-traditional ways I, um mm -hmm. my dad was a, a a car mechanic growing up and he always used to invent new ways of I remember once he was telling me about some sort of brake pipe that you had to make having steel and it had to be bashed, but he worked out that he could buy a copper pipe and bend it with his hand and do it in a third of the time. I think those kind of that sort of solution creativity, I, I suppose, is mm. where where I've been influenced and lots of sort of make do and mend sort of attitude within uh, my mum and dad and my grandparents and yeah probably mm -hmm. influenced from that they, you know no one's painting or there's no sculptures or sculptors sorry or or anything like that it's yeah slightly non-traditional but yeah it's truly creative family in that sense oh, fantastic and did you always sort of like the sort of brand creative marketing world or was that you know did you think you'd be a writer early on and uh, not you... really i think i liked i liked advertising without realizing i, I was into advertising um and I did, when I was at university, very randomly applied for a grad scheme at um, uh, what they were called BMP DDB at the time, which I suppose is Adam and Eve now, um, and filled out an application form and didn't really have any clue what it was. I just knew that, <laughs> wow, what a fluke it would be to get into this industry. Um, didn't get that, didn't even get an interview, but um, ended up in that industry, which was yeah, which has been brilliant. I haven't I haven't looked back. I really felt like on day one I'd, I'd found my place, and um, it was just so cool. Just initially, just making telly was amazing, yeah. and then you know seeing a, a, a an ad in a newspaper that you'd written, and I still get such a buzz from from that now. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of the best things, isn't it? Seeing something mm. that started as a blank page and it's now an amazing piece yeah, of creative exactly. work, and yeah, 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 it doesn't, doesn't you, stop. 
and, and it obviously feels to me, you know, having followed you, you know, I came across you on LinkedIn, and um, mm. you know, it feels like you're very much flourishing in your in your new role, and um, you've obviously got something working really well. How have you found the transition from being purely copywriter to having to lead teams, and you know, now creative director? That's there's quite a yeah. large team, quite a large responsibility, and mm. your job, I suppose, is to find and make the you know the best people come out with the best ideas is there is there anything that you can share for anyone that's on that transition and then sort of secondly how do you get the best creatively out of people um i suppose that the the transition i think it was something i always knew i wanted to do and i kind of have cockily quite in a quite cockily way sorry said in the past that my second day in the industry i knew that i wanted to be the creative director (laughs) um uh, I suppose the transition was hard and it's a bit of a weird one because it's like when you get to your the absolute peak of your game as a copywriter and a creative then suddenly they it's like taking your star footballer off the pit and say well you're the manager now and it's all oh, right so I think in the early days it was it was hard um, not to want to hold the pen so to speak mm. and and really um influence creative ideas that way but i think you soon realize that you know i think the creatives we've had we have working under us are more talented than me um Mm. they're coming out with ideas i think i enjoy being able to add to their idea and suggest things and Mm -hmm. um and mold what they do um so i say in the early days it was difficult and it was more of a hybrid role when we were at McCann where we would still be writing yeah Mm -hmm. creatively directing people um the management side of the job is i there's no joy in it there's no joy in filling out uh appraisals i'm not going to (laughs) pretend i like that sort of thing um but i love to i love to encourage and nurture and i love to see someone's confidence grow and i think i'm quite good at that as well um so I get a real buzz from someone going from, you know, quite junior, like um, uh, Ed and Xander, who did the World Cup film in 2018 with us, and now they're absolutely flying uh, um, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, doing just sensational work and winning every award going. It's mm. great to see, to you know, perhaps played a small part in those those sort of journeys, which is, is great. Um, and there was a second half to the question, which you're going to have to remember. I'm going to try and remember that. Yeah, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose yeah. Um, it's, it's trying to think, how do, you know, what have you learned about getting the best, you know, or, or helping people get the best creative ideas um, out of themselves mm-hmm. and sort of setting them up for success, I suppose. Um, I th- again, I think it's a, a confidence thing. I think I've always thought that um, you kind of take so much from the best creative directors you work with, but you learn mm-hmm. so much from the shit ones. And the shitty ones for me were the ones where Tim and I would walk out of a work review feeling confused and questioning mm. what we're even doing here and all that sort of thing. The best ones was where you go in with, in hindsight, a pretty lame idea, but you come out feeling like you could conquer the world. And mm. um, it's very much, for me, it's just keeping it positive and letting them know that, you know don't worry we we've got your back and i think as a creative director you've always got you've got that emergency idea in your in your locker that do you know what if you you don't crack it then tim and i will sit together tonight and we'll we'll crack it we'll do something um which is good and that's you know takes years of experience i suppose to know how to get out of a a hole pretty quickly (laughs) but again it's that sort of that sort of problem solving that I, yeah, I just I love solving problems really, and you know, coming up with solutions and uh, just yeah, for for our creative teams, I think we are always sort of most receptive to those that are, that have real desire as well. Um, mm-hmm. There's it's frustrating when someone's got all the talent and and hasn't got the idea, and I think it's harder to encourage and be positive with them because, but. Um, because it, it's it's frustrating for us, but if there's like a, just a one percent talent, ninety nine percent effort from a person, then those people are always going to do well. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I kind of I can think of a hundred p- people that are amazing creatives that maybe haven't got 
the work ethic. Um, so you I think so that's we'll the most put, important thing then for you know for people yeah, starting de- out. Yeah, definitely. I think we I think we're all capable of having ideas, um, but those that are work hard, work hard, and I don't mean just like putting in hours and hours. It's kind of it's being an expert in their field, knowing what's winning the awards at the moment, what's the new bit of technology, what's mm. the new animation technique that no one else has discovered. Um, mm-hmm. It's that sort of energy which which you know really carries people and it's you know it's there's so many creators that we've kind of had under our wing have now gone on to i think they're not the greatest creatives ever but they mm-hmm. they just get it in that sense they get they get what success takes in this industry mm, you know fantastic yeah. and you know i think what i've always loved about the work that you share the work that your team produces is that you know i think like you said, it's no longer you can't just rely on one film that goes out in one place. Mm. There's there's a there's a campaign that you're building for every piece, and I, I always laugh sometimes when you see anything that goes out um, public domain. People often think, oh, they wasted time doing things in real life, or you know, or yeah. making mm-hmm. something that they could have done in CGI. And I th- yeah. I'm always like, you don't get it, and I, and I don't mean that in a bad <laughs> way, but I mean like I see the magic in what you guys create, and I'd love to hear it from your mm. um, your own words on why you do the behind the scenes why you actually build things instead of doing them cgi why you make and build and you know and go to that extra effort i would just love to hear you explain it to our audience yeah um i mean for us it's kind of what's important is to do do things that people have never done before um and to sort of push the boundary and um the so many projects like the the tapestry for the world cup that we did for the the winter olympics um even for the olympics it would be so easy and probably slightly cheaper just to do it in CGI and mm-hmm. um, fake stuff. And but the the response we get from the making of films when they see that we actually stitched every frame and uh, we actually used ice and built models and three D printed um, yeah. uh, little things. Um, I think that just adds to the magic of it. And if it becomes that that's the story that enables the work also to get talked about beyond yep. being, Oh, that's, that's great. Not interested, but that's great. And here's a bit of a, an anecdote or an insight about how that was made. Um, uh, and it, it works as it's not just for our own gratification because it, it kind of, it does, I don't really exaggerate, but it sends us to the edge of madness doing it when it's mm-hmm. you know we'll be sat there at like uh, 2 a.m watching someone stitch another bit of tapestry on a machine that's about to like melt down because it's so hot mm-hmm. thinking what on earth are we doing they said you could just do this in cgi but the end result is um is is far higher and it's it takes those those specially crafted bits of work it just takes them further it makes them you know talk abilities something i don't think we rate enough in this industry it's not enough to do a you know a a 30 second ad with a a bit of a a tiny bit of humor in it it's kind of what's going to get it talked about beyond beyond what that you're just presenting what's the what's the story you can tell and um it's that those pieces do great stuff for bbc creative as well because it enables us to attract you know, talent, we, we don't really compete on salary at all, um, being public sector. Um, but we can compete on opportunity and, yeah. and win hands down because creatives come to us knowing that, you know, your ideas, there's, there's plenty of briefs, your ideas are going to be made and they're going to be made better than you'd make them anywhere else. Yeah. Um, I'm so bought yeah. into it, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know, I, I love that you guys do that, and that you get to do that, and uh, you know, we wouldn't be talking about it now if it wasn't if it wasn't a successful idea. So, I, you know, I, yeah, I'm 100 sure. percent behind it- your your same way of thinking. I love the tapestry on the FIFA 2018. I mean, how does your um have you sort of any insight for anyone listening on how you got to that idea specifically uh, for that campaign or or any of the other ones that you you know I know we. We, um, yeah. the one with the ice as well um, that's yeah, a similar sure. sort of idea but uh, you know just love it, um, to hear how you get to those ideas um, well I suppose the idea for the the tapestry in its in itself is there's nothing groundbreaking about it it was the idea was history will be made 
Um, and the idea was to show the history of the World Cup. And it's kind of promising the viewer that something amazing is going to happen. There's every world, I'm a big football fan, and every World Cup I can think of moments because it stays with you because it's, it's so important. So that was kind of the insight. And there's nothing particularly groundbreaking or ownable. You know, ITV could do the same ad. Um, uh, so we knew we wanted to, um, we knew that we've probably been driven down um, an animation route because um, using footage of players from the World Cup is expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and equally, trying to get a footballer in a room for an hour to film something is, I don't know if you ever worked with footballers, it's the, the least gratifying <laughs> celebrities out there uh, so um it's really hard really stressful so we were kind of limited in that sense which i always think limitations are, are the best thing you can happen in yeah, being a creative, uh, a creative. Um, so we were thinking about how we could do this and we're looking at sort of visual references from russia because we wanted the um we wanted to, it to feel inherently russian as well and russian representation of football um, so from an art direction point of view, that takes you to uh, kind of revolutionary posters, which sometimes have the wrong connotation um, and and sort of various things. Um, and Ed and uh, Xander found um, these kind of, uh, I think they're like waistcoat, waistcoats and skirts from sort of the Russian folk history. And it's old people used to embroider these stories. So let's embroider these stories and let's animate it and it was like how the hell do you do that uh we googled we googled it found someone had done it um on a quite basic level uh and nikos uh Livesey. um he'd done it for his own band for a, a music video um and he was signed to blinking so we went to blinking and said we like we got this idea we want to animate tapestry you've got this guy who does it and then yeah, the rest is history, really. But there was so much testing, and um, we became experts on the thickness of threads and sort of the yeah. level of material because you kind of need a 3D um, sort of scale to things. We ended up – you kind of have to – in that instance, when you do stop motion, you have to make the ad about four times because you do your pencil drawing as an animation first, and then um, you do it coloured in, and then you, you – do the um you have your sort of yeah every single frame has to be fed into this uh stitching machine um and so yeah that was and did you do 20 there's like 24 frames a second did you do that sort of many 24 Uh, 25 i think it's no i think on animated stop motion it's 12 um 12 or maybe it's 24 but i know there's 600 frames which three of them are just behind me on that you can kind of see those yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. so um uh so yeah it was kind of it was such a labor of love and yeah it's it's done us so well and yeah i really believe that that ad is why like i'm sat here now you know Um, congratulations yeah um and then again we blinking we become close collaborators with blinking and we get on really well with them so for the winter olympics we went to them and said we've got this idea rough idea not again not a groundbreaking idea um and we want to animate something in ice and then away we go (laughs) so it starts with something lofty and and silly and it's um you know we don't also don't want to become known as the people that at this time i'm going to animate in for qatar sand because we need to we need to do something different next time um because there's no joy in repeating the trick but yeah, that was the, the process of, of getting there. Yeah, no, fan, fantastic. And um, obviously can't ignore that big shiny piece of gold on your shelf behind behind your left <laughs> ear, I think it is. Um, so right, you must right, be super yeah, proud. Yeah. You, you guys won a BAFTA for the Tokyo 2020 campaign. Do you want to talk us through that campaign for uh, anyone who doesn't know? Uh, well, it's, it was called um, uh, Let's Go There, which was all about the BBC taking people to Japan um, for the Olympics. Um, virtually at least, um, offering sort of the, the best coverage. Um, and part of the process, part of the money saving issue actually is the reason we won that BAFTA is because um, the, if we make a film good enough, it can also be the title sequence to the to the show. So we worked with the people that designed the 3D studio as well. So 
on the title sequence, you saw our ad with a slightly different ending, which went straight into Gabby Logan or, or whoever it was presenting um, straight into their studio, which was pretty seamless. Um, so that was that BAFTA's for um, uh, titles and graphic identity. Um, and yeah, it was uh, just, it was very surreal. And then to, to be there and to be sat with, sort of these sort of semi-famous people get, you know, go into the loo next to Tony Robinson was, <laughs> was quite weird. Um, uh, and then they, yeah, they call you up, you win the award and then you go to this weird back room and you have to sign this contract and you're given an award with a number on it. And it's like, do not lose this award. If we ever catch you selling it, we will sue really? you and all this sort of thing. So how, how yeah, much do you so want that, for it? <laughs> Well, I say I can't sell it because they, they can make it some way. And there's a clause in this contract that says we, can, we will buy it off you for 50 pence. And it was like, oh, right, okay, well. So I'm kind of scared of it now. I, can't, I don't want to lose it just in case they want it back at some point. I know. Um, well, it's, it's great that you've, you've got it there on your shelf. The rest of the team must be like, <laughs> when do we get a shot? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, there are six of them all together. I've just got one of them. Um, right, okay. But that's only just arrived here. My mum had it for a couple of months and was taking it to sort of her sort of social gatherings at her local Starbucks and stuff. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. No, you must be proud. And it's nice to stop for these moments sometimes because I think, you know, our industry is very fast paced and you've, you know, you've got to sometimes stop and take um, yeah. Yeah, credit for amazing. some of the, the, the great things. So congratulations. I'm, I'm going to say congratulations for that, you know. Oh, <laughs> um, is it, uh, big question, but what's the sort of biggest lesson you've learned creatively in your career or even not creatively? What, what is there anything, mm-hmm. you know, we, we get a lot of younger people listening to this these episodes yeah. and some of them are trying to get their way into work some of them are in work and they're obviously you know you're an aspirational um you're an aspirational role you're you've, you've created yeah. lots of great work is there any any sort of big lessons you can give to people um there's a say i mean there's a there's a few and i think it it all comes down to to your approach i think one thing is kind of just being a cultural sponge it's like listening to conversation i still listen to over listen uh, overhear conversations in you know on the train or there's nothing like listening to two northern women in a coffee shop talking it's amazing um so it's kind of just being open to everything it's not the sort of go to all the art galleries it's kind of listen to life happening and the, the real stuff um i think the best piece of advice i've been given and we still dish out to this day is if you've got to eat shit don't chew so if something has no, you know, there's no creative gratifications that are ever going to come from this project or it's it's really dull, it's really boring, just get through it as quick as you can because the next brief might be the, the amazing brief. Mm-hmm. It's kind of don't don't waste your time complaining and, and everything. So we, we stand by that uh, today. Um, and then... Uh, it's kind of just the tenacity has taken Tim and I a long way from our big break was a, a WKD ad in uh, 2007, mm-hmm. which um, was rejected on the basis that it was juvenile by the um, uh, ASA or someone like that, um, of which we were told, uh, sorry, lads, it's all, it's over. You need to go on to the next thing. So yeah. we wrote, a, we just wrote a letter as you did then and, um, reasoning why it wasn't juvenile blah 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 and sent it off and got a letter back saying no you can okay we accept your Mm -hmm. your reasons um and which was absolutely life-changing because we were told don't do that because it's i suppose it's too much effort for us as an agency to do that and we would be like well you know fuck that let's let's see if we can do it because we're so close to making something It'd yeah. be a shame now, and yeah, and the rest is history, really. And we got a job at McCann just for that. So there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and I think I read somewhere that 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 wicked <clears throat> had brief at a three grand budget. Was that right? Oh uh, no, that's the uh, we did a thing for Domino's. Domino's had just oh, fired yes. uh-huh. the agency, mm-hmm. and there was three k left in the uh, budget, and um, they they can nobody cared at that point. It's like, what do you want to do with this? And we. I, I think we did drone deliveries of pizza before anyone else did. Um, <laughs> at least we thought we did at the time. Um, so we did that and it um, 
we missed it was supposed to go out on april fool's day <clears throat> we missed the deadline ended up going out in the middle of june i once all the noise had, had died down because april fool's day is a waste of time um uh and then people thought it was real and got a phone call on a sunday night saying you're not gonna believe this but you're on jay leno tonight because <laughs> he's picked up on your film and yeah again it was an absolute game changer for us and now everyone has done a drone <clears throat> delivery idea Everyone's for every brand it. on the planet haven't they <laughs> exactly the problem with the floor is that <clears throat> someone's face is just going to get chopped off because you can't have a helicopter coming down to deliver anything and you're taking it away. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, great, great. Well, um, James, I could talk all day. Um, I suppose just to leave us on the last moment, you know, we, we spoke earlier about how younger generations, um, you know, you've kind of the effort out, sort of outplays talent and um, showing mm -hmm. that. But I just wonder if there's anything else for people trying to get into the creative industries. A lot of people have had it hard with the pandemic and they've kind of missed a period where um, people have gone in. Any, any sort of lasting thoughts for, for, for anyone trying to get a move into the creative industries and what they should focus their um, time on? Yeah, I think um, you've got to get people's attention and there are so many people you've, you've got to consider if you're graduating, for example, everyone in your class is competing with with you so you've got to get noticed it does my heading when people send just a, an email with their cv and portfolio attached it's so boring but mm -hmm. if someone sends it by post with you know some quirky idea attached to it or you know as has happened a few times you get accosted as you leave the office and someone goes here's my portfolio and you think oh that's weird <laughs> they're, they're the, I, I love that that's that's how you get noticed you've got to do you've got to look at what everyone else is doing throughout your creative career and do something different it's i think it's so easy but I, so many people don't get that well, I'm going to ask a second question because I love those mm. I love those creative CVs as well because I think it's like your first brief, right? It's to catch attention in the yeah. studio and get people talking mm -hmm. about you. And I've had so many. I've had like people send jigsaws one piece a day for a month, or of you know <laughs> boxes of yeah. balloons and all sorts of things. And um, I just wonder, what is there any standout ones for you of where anyone's applied and they've done something super um, creative? You really? Uh, I had a, <laughs> a, a crazy uh, box thing which I had to flip around and. Um, Nothing for me that's like absolutely incredible. I know at McCann Bristol, McCann did that, um, um, the girl on Wall Street who stood the bronze cast of the fearless girl in, in Wall Street that you had the Wall Street bull and she was facing it. Um, one graduate spray painted herself bronze and stood outside McCann's offices for the day. Um, I think that's just brilliant and yeah. absolutely give her a job yeah uh -huh. I've, had, I've had some people dressing up as well i had someone dressed as the mad hatter from alice in wonderland and they turned up in the right. office and we were like what is this person doing and it turned out it was like the person who was applying's wife who had done it came for them <laughs> i had one where there was like a, a six-year-old child walked in the door with a box and it said andy's room like toy story on it and they handed right. the cv and it was like a mr potato head inside and you know oh, but that's uh, so good because it's mm -hmm. you want you want that not an email which yeah, yeah. believe me you get 10 a day and it's yeah, yeah i rarely read them so, i don't know if you heard all that banging there a second ago but there's basically like there's crows trying to get into my little home studio here oh, really? do you know what weirdly i thought that was here i thought someone was banging no, something it's, outside it's, it's here there's like these these oh, right. horrible scary crows that keep pecking my window is um, this the shed you're in the shed yeah you? i'm in the i'm in the garden both yeah. so yeah. <laughs> they're, they're trying to get in here for whatever reason james thank oh, you so least. much um yeah hugely inspiring career and you know well done because it's uh, great work that you guys are producing and you're clearly in your happy place so um, it's been Absolutely, a delight to yeah. talk to you and um, yeah thanks for listening everyone <laughs>